Promise Level 1 V-Track E-Class Training. I'm Mark and I'll be helping you through the installation today. I happen to have a V-Track right here and the kit contains everything you need. You're going to need a buddy to help you lift the V-Track out of the box as it tends to be pretty heavy. So why don't we get started here? To safely transport the V-Track, it's a good idea to save the packaging. We've got the unit unpacked, now let's install a rail kit. You're going to want to loosen these screws to adjust the rail to fit your rack. I happen to have a pre-adjusted rail right here. Next, you're going to want to install the rails with the flange down. So let's go ahead and put it in. While each V-Track comes with a free rail kit, your rack manufacturer will provide the mounting hardware. Also, make sure your rails are level and your screws are firmly fastened. As a reminder, use two people to lift the V-Track and always lift by the base, not the handles. Now that we've racked the V-Track subsystem, we're going to remove the drive bays in order to get the drives installed. When handling drive trays, it's best to work with them top to bottom, one column at a time. When working with hard drives, one should follow ESD safe procedures. This includes properly grounded workspace, equipment, and personnel. The V-Track subsystem can be populated with SAS or SATA hard disk drives. For optimal performance, install physical drives of the same model and capacity. The drive's match performance allows the logical drive to function better as a single drive. If dual controllers are present in your V-Track and if you plan on using SATA drives, you must install an AA MUX adapter with each SATA drive. As a note, AA MUX adapters are sold separately. Also. Be sure to use all four screws when installing the MUX adapter, as well as any hard drive installed in the V-Track subsystem. As you can see, drive installation is easy. It simply slides forward to connect. You won't need an AA MUX adapter for a SAS drive. SAS drives, by nature, are dual ported and do not require that AA MUX adapter. SATA drives are single ported, and the use of an AA MUX adapter allows both controllers to communicate with the SATA drive. When repopulating the V-Track, it's best to push on the drive carrier, then press the latch to click it into place. Now that we've fully populated the V-Track with drives, let's go around back and cable it up. Before we begin cabling the V-Track, let's go through some of the cables you may need to make the connections. This is the mini SAS cable to be used in expansion. It comes with the J-Class. The most popular way to connect the V-Track to your host system is through fiber optic cabling but please note that you're going to need an SFP transceiver to connect that fiber optic cabling. Alternatively, you can connect with copper cabling. Notice how that transceiver comes attached to the copper cabling. The V-Track comes with two Ethernet management ports. We recommend that you use either CAT 5E or CAT 6 Ethernet cable to make that connection. Alternatively, you can use the RS-232 serial cable connection. Now please note, if you have a host system that does not have a DB9, you're going to need to pick up a DB9 to USB adapter to make that connection. So let's go start cabling. The V-Track comes in single and dual controller models. I happen to have the dual controller model here, so I'm going to start the cabling. It's all plugged in on the host side, so let's begin. Here's a SAS port. We won't need it for this configuration. So I'll go ahead and start plugging in my SFP transceivers into the host ports. Notice that we're going with optical cabling on this. You have an alternative of using the copper cabling. Next we're going to get our CAT6 Ethernet cable and plug each side of the management port in. Now I'm going to get the RS-232 serial connections and plug the RJ-11 side in to the corresponding ports. Now I'll take my fiber channel cables, plug each one into the corresponding SFP transceiver. Although the cabling may appear to be overkill, this is a dual redundant system capable of withstanding most any component failure. Now for the final step, I'm going to plug in both power cables. Now that we've completed the cabling, both to our V-Track and the host system, I'm going to power on the subsystem. 
Let's give it about three minutes for the boot to complete. There are LED indicators on the rear and the front of the V-Track subsystem. These provide current status of the V-Track. Now that we've powered up the V-Track, all the lights are green and functioning normally, let's go into WebPAM and configure the storage. The first step is to establish communication with the serial port. You'll need terminal emulation software, and I happen to have HyperTerminal right here, so let's configure it. I've configured COM1 with the RS-232 attaching to my host, so let's configure COM1. You're going to set 115.200 to be the bits per second, data bits remain at 8, parity is none, stop bits 1, flow control is none, click OK, and next when we enter, we're going to set our IP address. Administrator is the default login, and password is the default password. Now we're in the CLI. I'm going to type in menu. That takes us to what we call the CLU. Once you're in CLU, I'm going to use the arrow key to navigate down to network management. Hit enter and then hit enter again under net management ethernet port settings. DHCP is disabled by default, so I'm going to enable it to get an automatic IP address. I'm going to hit the space bar. That enables DHCP. Now I'm going to use the arrow key, go down to save settings. Go ahead and hit the Y key to save the settings. Now that we've established our network settings, we're going to make a note of this IP and use it to log into WebPAM Pro. Administrator is the default username and password is the default password. Go ahead and enter these and click login. Now that we've logged into WebPAM Pro, the first thing you'll see is the array configuration if you have unconfigured physical drives. The first option is the automatic configuration. It takes all of your drives creates one array with a logical drive in that array. Second option is the express configuration. This will give the user some options, but all the logical drives will remain the same still. Finally, we've got the advanced configuration here. That gives the user full reign over the system. Any amount of logical drives can be created with any type of RAID level. So first, let's go ahead and show you the automatic configuration. So go ahead and make sure it's highlighted and click Next. This is the summary screen. Notice how 15 of the 16 physical drives are selected. That's because automatic configuration takes one of those drives and uses it as a global spare. Now what we have left here is a RAID 6 for all 15 drives at the highest capacity possible. The stripe size stays at the default, 64K. Sector size is 512 bytes. The read policy is read ahead and the write policy is write back. Again, all default settings. Once you're clear and you've checked the summary, go ahead and click Submit to start building your array. I'm going to select the Advanced Configuration, so I'll make sure that it's checked and then click Next. This first screen is where we create the array. An array is a group of physical drives that is the container where your logical drives will reside. I'm going to create an array of three physical drives. Highlight each drive, click Select, move it over to the right hand side, once you've selected your drives, click Next. I want to create a RAID 5. Depending on how many drives I have in my array, different RAID levels will appear that I can use. I'm going to use the full capacity of this RAID set. The Stripe, Sector, Read and Write policy, by default, these settings work for most applications. I'm going to keep the preferred controller ID at automatic, but if you have two controllers, you can select which controller will be handling your RAID set. The automatic settings dynamically allocate those resources. When you're happy with your settings, click Update. Once I've updated it, you can see that I've used the entire contents of the logical drive. If I were to only use half of the contents, this bar would only show up halfway. This allows you to create more than one logical drive for your array. So once you're happy, click Next. Make sure that all your settings are finalized before you start building your array. I see that the number of physical drives I'm using are three, physical drive IDs of four, five, and six, configurable capacity, free capacity is zero, I use the entire logical drive. Once you've uh, checked everything and you're happy with the configuration, you'll click the submit button to start building your array. Now that we've created the disk array, you'll notice that a logical drive setting populates under disk array. Now let's move up the navigation tree. Let's take a look at some of the other items. Clicking on Disk Array 0 gives us a frontal view of the V-Track 
when I click on UPS, it shows all the settings if I had a UPS connected. Moving up to Enclosure, it gives me a pictorial display of all the health of the subsystem, including enclosure, controller, cooling unit, and power supplies. And I can even get more detailed information if I click on the advanced controller information. Clicking on Administrative Tools opens up a list of the management and monitoring tools built into the VTRAC. Even more detailed information can be obtained from the subsystem service report if you open a case with technical support, this is one of the first pieces of information they'll require. I'm going to go ahead and save the subsystem service report. The VTRAC subsystem service report is a comprehensive text-based report that contains advanced information as well as all NVRAM and runtime events that have occurred. This service report will be helpful for tech support to troubleshoot and diagnose the issue on the VTRAC. Now that we've configured the VTRAC, let's expand the unit with the J-Class. Configuring the J-Class is pretty much the same as the E-Class. Install your rail kit, slide the chassis into place, and then go around back to configure your cabling. Now that we've slid the J-Class into position, we need to make the expansion cabling. Remember that SAS port I was telling you about earlier? We're going to make the connection with the SAS cable now. Go ahead and plug it into the circle part of the top into the diamond part on the bottom on the J-Class. Now remember, we're working with dual controllers here, so I need to make that connection on the other side as well. So I'm going to go ahead and plug it into the circle portion on the top, on the E-Class, down into the diamond position on the J-Class. Now, four J-Class units can be plugged in underneath the E-Class, so what you're going to want to do is take that SAS cable, plug it into the circle portion of this connection, down into the diamond connection of the next J-Class, so on and so forth. So finally, what we're going to want to do is make the power connections here. Power number one, power number two. So once you've powered on the J-Class unit, it's important to let it boot up completely before you power on the E-Class. Now that we've cabled up and powered on our J-Class, let's go back into WebPAM to configure the additional storage. My existing storage is there under logical drives. I want to make sure that the expansion chassis has been added. So when I click on the enclosure view, I can see that enclosure number two has been added. That tells me that my expansion chassis is successfully set up. I could go even further to take a look at the 16 drives that have been added to the subsystem. So now to configure additional storage, We'll just go back down to disk arrays. This takes us to the guided setup where we can configure our additional storage. Thanks for joining us for Promise Level 1 VTRAC E-Class training. As you can see, setting up the VTRAC is a cinch. On behalf of everybody at Promise, thanks for joining us.